Hello. for being here. Hello. But the first question that I have for you is, how did this, how did this project of Be a Movie start and who had the idea? Well, I, I didn't have the idea. <laughs> yeah. the, the idea was a, a collaboration between um, Heiko Lange and Jörg Hopper. They've been talking about making a, a, a collage, a collage of original images to make into a kind of like a 90 minute movie accompanied by music from the 80s. And they asked me if I would restore the soundtracks of these records of the like the 70s and 80s so that it would sound good in the cinema. And then when they explained what the project was about, I said, well, I actually got some footage at home. Maybe they, you'll find some images in there that you can use. And they were, then I, I just gave them a box of film and footage and tapes, and they were like, oh, what is this? <laughs> uh, we've changed our plans, you know. And, and so the original idea wasn't made with the fan footage, but with uh, a recreation of no, 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 it was going to be made with original footage. Okay. But the, the, it didn't really have a story. Okay. Right? It was just going to be just images with music. Okay. Yeah, like, like a long there. video. Yeah. yeah. Uh, but when I came along and they started to ask me about my life, yeah. um, then I explained all the things that I'd done while living in Berlin, because I've lived there since 1978. Yeah. Um, they realised that as a Brit, as, a, as an Englishman living in Berlin in this period, it was a different approach. To, to, to the way a German would look at West Berlin, yeah. you know? Uh, if a German looked at West Berlin and told their story, it'd be very, it'd be very sad and very depressive because of the division of Germany and everything. But because I'm British, I don't think like that. I looked at it more cynically and with more humour. And, and so it, it was a different approach. And, and, and they liked the idea of having a foreigner tell the story of West Berlin rather than German. So, so the, I became the protagonist. Yeah. So the narrative is all your life, is all based on your life? Yes, yes, okay. yes. For some moments the viewer can get confused because I don't know if there is an actor playing your role uh, and it's just, we don't know if it's you or if it's an actor. Um, well, at the very beginning of the film where you see me working in a record shop, yeah. that's an actor <laughs> because Nobody filmed me working yeah. in a record shop in, the, in 1978, yeah. you know. It but wasn't, you worked? It was, but I worked in a record oh, shop. Okay. But, it, but it wasn't interesting to film in a record shop. Yeah. Why would you waste that footage? But <laughs> the actor is really similar to you. Yes, of course. <laughs> and he was also found by pure chance. They were looking for someone to portray me as a young person in the film for these kind of, like, segments that they need to film. And they were looking for some guys, and they'd come with, like, six-foot-six six guys and all different things. And none of them fit into my clothes, right? Because I still had all my old clothes. So they, they, none of these people would fit in, in their clothes. And this girl who was looking for, the, for the, 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 the double, she was really frustrated. She'd been to some agency, and she couldn't find anybody. And she, went, she was in the lift. She was going out of the building, yeah. the lift doors open, and, and this guy, really Marius, is standing there, and she went, oh, you're it. It's you. It's you, yeah. And this footage, this footage were all yours, or are you just... Uh... No, no, no. In, in reality, because it's all little snippets of film. Yeah. Now, on a Super 8 camera, when you film, you have two to maximum three minutes of footage mm -hmm. of film. Yeah. So, m mostly, when you film, you, like, not all of, all of it's going to be usable. You maybe have this much, and this much on its own is not a movie. But if you put it all together, maybe. you have a film. Yeah. So all these snippets, in, in, in reality, B-Movie has about 70 cinematographers in reality, you know. And this narrative was all based on your life, but there are another inputs from other people, or it's well, like well, a diary? <laughs> no, but I couldn't remember anything at all. It was really hard. <laughs> you know, you try and remember what you did, at, you know, 10 years ago, or something, yeah. 25 years ago, or 30 years ago. It's a bit difficult. Um, only Good Run, a little bit, had, uh, you know, some things to say, but okay. everything you see is, is from the time, yeah. apart from my voiceover, which is the narration of my life, of the things that I experienced, the things that I saw, and the, the people that I met. And I kind of, kind of mixed them together. Yeah. You know? And what did you feel when reviewing these images after a long time? Well, I don't really like seeing myself on camera. 
I never watch myself on camera. So why, why do you see it as an actor? Is that a well, I, I, don't, I don't mind doing it, you know, like I'm doing this interview now, but I would <laughs> never watch it. Yeah. Okay. I, I, you know, I don't, mind, I don't mind doing it, as long as I don't have to watch it, then, yeah. then I'm okay. Yeah. Yeah. So you don't uh, feel so comfortable with, uh, with seeing you as, a, as an actor in this movie? Have you, have you seen the movie? I have. <laughs> I have, yes. I mean, it, it, you know, I have to accept it as it is because that's how it is. But, it, you know, for me, it's quite uncomfortable, I must confess. To see myself on screen, I think to myself, oh, God, I'm making a real fool of myself here, you know, it's ridiculous, you know. But that's how it is, you know. Yeah. For me, I'm born in the 90s. Uh, this documentary is much more about, uh, it's, it's not only about music, it's mm. much more than that. Mm. Uh, do you feel that as well? or? Well, let, my real kind of incentive for this making this film, as it, as the process kind of carried on and the things we kind of talked about, uh, and and how the film kind of developed, it was more of a of a, an inspirational film really more than anything else. I, I didn't want to kind of like just dwell on how great the 80s were. You know, it's not like oh everything was better back then because it wasn't. Um, I thought, but it shows people now how we lived and experienced things back then and, 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 and the energy that we, we found. Because we did everything with no money and just with inspiration and ideas. And, uh, and it was like we all came together and we worked together as a, as a kind of like this little group of people all doing things together and helping each other. And it wasn't like there was a competition, they're better than us or whatever. It was more like um, acceptance, you know, like they do their thing. We do our thing. I, I played in a band called the Umbekanten. For, in, in the eyes of Einstein and the Neubau, we were pop music, you know. <laughs> but we, we were all part of the same scene, and and we each had our own place within that scene. And and I see B movie today more as an inspiration for people if they want to find out how things were back then in the 80s, how we did things then. And it, and, and and it's just about you just have to have an idea no matter how crazy your idea is. You know, if I said to you, I'm going to make a band and I'm going to play on building site rubbish that I find lying around the streets, you'd think I was crazy. But Einstein and Neubauten did exactly that, and look what happened. Yeah. But uh, you kind of can smell the atmosphere of the Hades in this movie, like the Berlin Thank Wall, you. the fall of the Berlin Wall. So, in a way, that's political. Yes, of course, yeah. I mean, well, politics, uh, politics affects us all the time, whether you like it or you don't, you know, whether you watch the news or you don't, it affects you in some way, even subliminally. And that also affects the way you make your music, if you're, if you're an artist making music or painting or sculpture or anything, it still affects you in some way. And you need to, f f you know, express your frustrations or your, your feelings and, and it comes out and manifests itself in, in the way you make your music. Uh, you, you might not particularly be focusing on a particular theme, yeah. but what that yeah. political element does, it affects you personally exactly. in some way so that you put it into your music or your art. And, 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 and of course B-Movie is a very political film too at the same time because you know that was about a, an island in G Germany um, and it was about division, a division of a city. In B-Movie, we, we, we show a very, very, very small portion about East Berlin. We actually don't mention East Berlin so much in the film. Um, but remember, Berlin was two halves, you know, yeah. East and West. So, so Ber West Berlin has become forgotten. Mm -hmm. People don't know what it was like in, in the 80s. They can't remember, uh, or they were never there. And as, as East Berlin kind of transformed into this new city, and completely, it's completely different. West Berlin almost stayed the same. It's hardly changed very much. Maybe the buildings are a bit brighter now, but the, the, the feeling in West Berlin is still the same as it used to be. It's not changed that much. And, and, and in that sense, you know, the film is very political in that sense, because it shows you this kind of like duality of Berlin. You know? It's still contemporary, the portrait of Berlin West, so... Is it? Contemporary. If, if, if Berlin West right now, it's kind of like it's shown in the movie? Um, I, th I, th I think Berlin in itself has, has not changed that much, really, in a, in, in a lot of respects, you know. Yeah, people talk about gentrification. That's the price of capitalism, I'm afraid, yeah. you know. Uh, 
yeah, that's what you get. Yeah. But the, the, fact that the, the same kind of people who came to Berlin in the 80s, they're still coming to Berlin now because they realize that Berlin is the, probably the most free-thinking city in the world. You know, it's very open-minded and it's very cultural. There's so many activities going on there on a daily basis that you can never get tired of living there. You know, it's, and, and, and I think that's, it's, it's attractive. It's still cheap, you know, it's, it, compared to say London or Paris or Rome or whatever. It's really, really cheap still. Uh, that may change in the future, we don't know. But we don't, we don't have any kind of industry in Berlin. We only have entertainment. We only have art and culture, uh, uh, cultural things happening. So that attracts these kind of people to Berlin, you know. You didn't show in the movie, and you told me in the another interview that it was proposed that uh, East Berlin is never, uh, never appeared. Uh, but I, I would like you to, to, to tell us again that story that you went to a concert in Berlin East, and mm. how did you just uh, take the instruments to there? The, well, the, 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 the first, the first concert we did, um, I, I, I actually was in a in a in a East Berlin bar having a drink with some friends and in these bars they had very long tables and you sat together with people that you didn't know and at the end of this table was some hippie guy just listening to the conversation and he and he realized that my dialect is not really German and he was like where do you come from and I said I'm from England and he was like what he, he never met an English person before and and then we just talked, started talking about music and he told me that he had a guitar and he played in a church And I'm like, okay, so you play like, you know, Christian songs or something. It's like, no, no, I play like Eric Clapton and blues and things like this. It's the only place I can play. I don't have a license to play. And he explained to me the, the difficulties in actually being in a musical group in East Berlin. You couldn't just form, you couldn't just go to a, a guitar shop, buy a guitar and an amplifier and drums and start a band. You, everything was controlled, right? You, they didn't have electric guitar shops. You couldn't just go and get an electric guitar. So he'd acquired this guitar, and he told me about this church and that they did this blues mass. And I was like, that's interesting. Maybe I could do it with my band. But no one had a synthesizer. No one would give me their cassette player. So I was thinking, okay, I have to like change this and work something else out. And so I asked the Toten Hosen would they be interested in going because my friends, I knew, They all really loved the Toten Hosen because I'd smuggled their music into East Berlin, right, on cassette, so my friends could listen to this. So they oh. knew this band, and I said, would you do the Toten Hosen instead? Because it's guitars, bass, drums, really easy. <laughs> But it was very difficult to find the, a band that would lend us the instruments even, right? So we did this one concert in this church in a, a part of East Berlin called Rummelsburg, and we invited 30 people and said it's very top secret. It's, it was, you know, the idea of a secret gig, if I said to you, this, a band like The Killers, they're playing a secret gig, it'd all be very professional and everything, PA, everything there. This was secret gig, nobody was allowed to know. Very, very small amount of people, very private. And really, like, you know, only 30 people came and we were constantly worried that the police would come and stop the gig and everything. What we didn't realize at the time was that this had never ever been done before. It was always, you know, like Western bands that had appeared on East German TV were like things like Boney M, you know, <laughs> that kind of thing. But, but a punk band playing in East Berlin had never, it had never been, would never happen officially because punk rock didn't officially exist in East Germany even, right? So this band had played and it suddenly caused this wave in, in East Germany when they, all these kids hear that this... Tolton Hosen have played in East Berlin. It was like, what? where did they play in a church? All these punk bands went to the churches in their local communities and said, can we, can we play a gig in your church? It's like, it's not a gig, it's a church service. Now, okay, we don't care, we'll do it. And so all the, all the churches throughout East Germany became this kind of passive resistance. All these punk bands started practicing in churches and it created this kind of new symbiosis of the, of the whole thing in East Germany. And then, About five years later, we decided to do it again in another church in East Berlin. This time the concert was disguised as a, as a, fest, as a concert for starving Romanian orphans. 
This was this was the the cover for this gig, and we um, and this time in the meantime I'd, be, I'd befriended an American soldier who had a car. Now American soldiers could travel into East and West Berlin without being controlled. There were no no border controls. So we put all the guitars into the and the camera, video camera in his car because normally he couldn't take a video camera into East Berlin. We we smuggled it in, took all the instruments to this to this church, and we'd said. Only 30 people, not yeah. more. <laughs> top secret. Yeah, top secret. We get to this church. <gasps> the police are sitting outside in a police car, and there's 600 people just hanging around everywhere. And we're like, who couldn't keep their mouth shut? You know, this is crazy. How are we going to do this? And the priest came to me and said, I'm really sorry, but the police have said the Totten Hosen cannot play this gig. It's, it's impossible. Right. They know they they know that the Totenhosen are coming to play this gig. They can't play. And I said to him, well, just tell the people what's happened and tell them that the Totenhosen can't play. But a band from Dresden is going to play him instead. And he's like, what band? Like the, the stars, he don't know what the Totenhosen look like. Yeah. So just tell them the band from Dresden are going to play instead. And so the Totenhosen played as a band from Dresden. <laughs> for 45 minutes and then we were found out because in, in all these people there's obviously like inofficial mil, you know like informers for the Stasi you know they told the police that's really the don't know but you know what the, 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 the thing was is that they, these kids even though they knew before that the Toten Holzen were going to play in East Berlin they didn't tell the Stasi before even though they were working for the Stasi as, as like informers right none of them told the Stasi before that this gig was going to actually take place right although they knew it was because of other things but like they didn't say you know because they all wanted to see the concert right? and and my friends also I think the reason why they you know I said to them look look you it's your lives which are going to be affected if we get caught, if we get stopped. You know, I, for me, I'll just get thrown out of the country and they'll never let me back in again and you'll never get any more music, right? You'll never meet bands from you know, the Western bands coming to visit Berlin. You won't meet these people anymore. I won't be able to smuggle any cassettes back into East Berlin. You'll, you, you'll never see me again. Your lives will be affected by this, you know. Do, do you want to be a part of this? And they were like, yeah. We do. We understand the, 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 what would happen. And, I, and, and the reason why they did that was because I think they felt the thrill of doing something completely illegal, that, which was too, so completely anti-state and so subversive that, they, you know, I had this effect every single time I went into East Berlin, smuggling cassettes into East Berlin, smuggling music into East Berlin. I had this feeling, this thrill of, of doing that every single time. And I think that they just wanted to feel that too, you know. And this was this concert was filmed. Or? The second one was filmed, yeah. and that's what that's the second concert is what you see in B movie. Mm. Okay. And last question is, what were your your expectations coming from Manchester back then? About Berlin. Yeah. Oh, I had absolutely none at all. I only went for, to go and buy some records. Okay. I, I, I went for the day, you know. I thought I'll go and I'll just go and look at Berlin and see what it's like because. I'd been to Germany before. Right? The first time I went to Germany was 1976. And, and I'd been traveling around in 77. And stuff. And every year I went a couple of times a year. And every time I said, oh, I'm thinking about going to Berlin, they'd be going like, why do you want to go there? What do you want to go there for? <laughs> I'm like, why, why, what's wrong with it? You know, oh, it's in the middle of communism and it's like, it's dark and miserable and everybody wants to leave there, you know. I'm thinking, oh, David Bowie made two fantastic records there. Yeah. Like, there must be something about <laughs> Berlin, you know. And I was thinking, if nobody goes there, then there's probably all these record shops full of all these old records that nobody <laughs> buys. I'll be able to buy, come home with carrier bags full of records. And so I go to Berlin and it was nothing like I imagined it to be. And it was like, it was fascinating. And it was these two, two, you know, two systems like communism and capitalism kind of clashing together, you know. And it was just like, just like unreal. And, and, and the first time I went to East Berlin, I was completely blown away by this place because it was just like traveling back into some kind of time capsule, you know. And I was, I was fascinated by this, and I, and, I, and I just couldn't believe. And once I started, once I got to know friends in East Berlin, got to know these kids in East Berlin, then I felt I had a lot of obligation to them to bring them music and people, you know, and try and 
enlighten their lives a little bit and make it, because they had a hopeless situation. They couldn't go anywhere. They could go to Czechoslovakia for their holidays and that was it, you know. That was your holiday, yeah? And I thought by just giving them something that they couldn't actually come to West Berlin to see the bands or whatever, I'd take them into East Berlin. And, and I thought that that was my, my vocation at that point. You're very welcome. I hope you'll enjoy the film. Yeah. You're very welcome.